This presentation was recorded at the 2015 ANZICS ACCCN Annual Scientific Meeting. Well, it's my pleasure now to um, welcome uh, back to the podium uh, Paul Young. Um, Paul uh, is one of the uh, leaders of the uh, research program uh, that CTG has had over the last few years looking at uh, temperature uh, management in the ICU and uh, has recently uh, had the success of um, having uh, the heat study um, published in one of those uh, Triple Crown journals um, and we look forward to um, Paul telling us more about that. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Colin. Um, so, um, firstly, before I get going, I'm going to apologise to the people at the CTG meeting two days ago because you're going to have to listen to the same talk. Um, I actually gave the talk yesterday in a different forum as well, so it's the third time I've done it in three days or something very close to it. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you about the heat trial, which, as you uh, all know, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine not so long ago. Um, and in fact, uh, in the week after it was published, it was the most viewed thing on the New England Journal of Medicine in any category of article, uh, which is nice. And uh, it's in the 99th percentile for uh, the papers that have had the highest impact in terms of people reading about them on the internet in the history of all medical publications after less than a month, and that's quite good. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, this is a mouse, this is a snake, this is a fish. I'm just checking, that is what I'm saying it is. Yep, yeah, that's a pigeon. These are honeybees. And all of those animals mount a fever in response to an infection. So fevers are broadly conserved biological process uh, across many animal species that evolved many millions of years ago. Um, and the conservation of a metabolically costly process across evolution raises the possibility or suggests, I think, that that response may have some protective uh, effect, or at least that the components of the immune system you'd imagine would have evolved to work uh, optimally in the physiological febrile range. These are bacteria growing on agar and the minimum inhibitory concentration of a range of uh, antibiotics for a range of bacteria is uh, lower when the bacteria are grown in uh, the physiological febrile range compared to the normal body temperature range. This man in the, the black suit at the back is Julius Wagner Jauric, and he's an Austrian physician who won the Nobel Prize in 1927, successfully treating neurosyphilis by inducing fever through inoculating patients with malaria. This contraption you can see on the screen here is the Kettering Hypertherm Chamber, which is an extreme way of treating gonorrhea. You bring the patient in from the community, you heat them up to 41.7 degrees, and that works quite well, I'm told. Um, and uh, so there's a whole range of reasons for believing potentially that fever might be a useful thing if you have an infection. And uh, in the lead up to the heat study, we conducted this observational study looking at the relationship between the peak temperature in the first 24 hours in the intensive care unit and your risk of death. Uh, and looked at the difference for patients who had an infection compared to patients who didn't have an infection. And in general terms, the relationship looked different. And if you had an infection, then a higher temperature after adjusting for illness severity was associated with a lower risk of death. And so all of these things, um, and the fact that we're using lots of paracetamol, dishing it out like lollies, no evidence to show whether paracetamol to treat fever was beneficial or harmful, led us to conduct the heat study which was a phase 2b randomised controlled trial comparing intravenous paracetamol with placebo in ICU patients with fever and a likely infection. The hypothesis was that in those patients, administration of paracetamol to treat fever would worsen outcomes, or more specifically, it would reduce the number of days that patients spent alive and free from needing intensive care. So to get into the study, you need to have fever and the treating doctor needed to think that you had an infection. 
You needed to not have any contraindications to paracetamol. You needed to not have an acute brain pathology. You were randomised to get a gram of intravenous paracetamol every six hours or a match placebo. And you continued that until your fever resolved. You stopped the treatment for the infection. You were discharged from the intensive care. You reached day 28 or you developed a contraindication. Most of those things are self-evident and straightforward, but the fever algorithm requires a little bit more explanation. So the patients were randomised on day zero. They all received the study medication until the morning of study day two. At that point, they were assessed, and the question was asked, has the patient been afebrile for 24 hours? If they were afebrile, the study medication was withheld. Over the next 48 hours, he looked at them to see whether they developed a recurrence of the fever. If they didn't develop recurrence of fever, then the study medication was uh, ceased, and at that point it was okay to use open-label paracetamol. But if at any point during the 48-hour observation period a fever returned, then the study medication restarted immediately. The patient went on and was assessed daily. Uh, and then if the patient was n not afebrile for 24 hours, then they continued the study drug and were continued to be assessed daily, and so the whole algorithm looked like that. Okay. So there were 3,601 patients who met the inclusion criteria. These are the major exclusions. There's some more that you can read if you have a look at the paper, but those are the main ones. There were 174 patients who didn't consent. There were just over 1,000 patients who were eligible for the study but weren't enrolled because of staffing reasons or other reasons. Um, there were 700 patients who were randomised, 352 to the paracetamol arm. The intention to treat population you can see there is uh, 346 patients. In the placebo arm, 348 patients uh, with an intention to treat population of 344. And I'm not going to put table one up on the screen because whenever people do that you can't read it anyway. So I'll tell you that the baseline characteristics of the two uh, treatment groups were very similar. The patients were aged around 60 years, two-thirds of them were male. The most common comorbidities were diabetes and cancer. More than 80% of the patients had sepsis and organ dysfunction. Half of the patients were invasively ventilated at baseline. Half of the patients were on inotropes of vasopressors, and the patients were moderately sick. Okay. So here's what we did. So this first graph shows the proportion of patients remaining in the intensive care unit on each study day from day 0 through to day 28 who received study medication. And as you can see in the first few days when there were lots of patients in the intensive care unit, we were giving out lots of study medication but that dropped off quite quickly as people reached one or more of those stopping criteria that we talked about before. The other thing that happened is as the study medication stopped, the open-label paracetamol started. Um, and so as, as we went through from day zero to day 28, uh, the use of open-label paracetamol rose. Um, but of course the number of patients remaining in the intensive care unit dropped as time went by as well. So overall there were around a third of the patients in both groups who received open-label paracetamol. Here's a graph that shows uh, the effect of intravenous paracetamol on body temperature in this patient population, and it is in fact an antipyretic, um, but it isn't a very good one. Um, so it significantly reduced your body temperature, but not by much. It significantly reduced your mean body temperature as well, again, but not by much. Um, and here's the primary outcome. So the primary outcome variable, as you remember, was the number of days that you spent alive and free from needing intensive care. And so you want to have a large number of ICU-free days if you can. And uh, there was no difference between the treatment groups. This is another way of looking at it. So this is the distribution of ICU-free days uh, by treatment group for the paracetamol patients and the placebo patients. Again, no significant difference there, but it just shows you a little bit more about the distribution of it and how many free days each uh, patient had. Here's the mortality data. So for day 28 and day 90 mortality, uh, there was no significant difference between the treatment groups. 
There's the Kaplan-Meier survival curves. Again, no significant difference between the treatment groups. Um, and here's the finding that maybe is the most interesting and surprising finding, which is the effect on ICU length of stay. So there was a, a different effect for the patients who survived and the patients who died. So if you were a non-survivor and you received paracetamol, then you stayed in intensive care for almost twice as long before you died. And if you were a survivor and you got paracetamol, then you left, left the intensive care unit significantly earlier. So an interesting uh, association and highly statistically significant. Uh, the other important effect demonstrated in the study was that there was no significant difference in the proportion of patients who stopped study medication because of the development of liver dysfunction. In fact, numerically, placebo was worse for your liver. Um, so here's the conclusion. So paracetamol did not alter the number of alive ICU free days in patients with fever and likely infection. Paracetamol appears to have a modest antipyretic effect in this population. Paracetamol appears to be well tolerated in adult ICU patients with fever and likely infection. And, and those are the main findings of the study, really. So, so I think those, those findings are what you'd put in the group of things that are practice informing rather than practice changing. So I haven't presented anything that I think says that you should do one, something one way or another way, but they do tell you about a very common therapy and what to expect when you administer it. Now, it's important to emphasise that the differences in observed uh, length of stay for survivors and non-survivors, um, it's hard to know exactly what those findings mean. There are a few possibilities. They might mean nothing. So this could be a type 1 error, a false positive, and uh, although the p-values were very, very low, this is a finding in a secondary outcome variable that was directly the opposite of the study hypothesis. And so uh, you have to consider the possibility that this uh, might just be a statistical anomaly, and if we do the same trial again, it wouldn't happen. Another possibility is that it might be that temperature matters, and the fact that we reduced temperature by a little bit for a period of time was enough to delay death not enough to stop people from dying, and maybe if we'd been more aggressive about controlling temperature, then we might have actually improved uh, patient outcomes. And I guess the rationale for that hypothesis would be that if you're really sick and you're supported beyond the limits of physiological homeostasis, then the thing that might actually matter might be uh, the metabolic demand, and perhaps reducing the metabolic demand through reducing body temperature might be a good thing. There are some other data out there that would uh, be consistent with that hypothesis. So these are the data from the sepsis cool study where they cooled patients with severe sepsis who were mechanically ventilated and requiring sedation to a normal body temperature or not. And in the cooling group at day 14, the mortality was significantly reduced. This is the uh, study from Gordon Bernard from the New England Journal of Medicine uh, some time ago where they administered ibuprofen and significantly reduced body temperature. And uh, the point estimates, again, favoured the temperature control group. Um, so one of the things that we're doing now um, is we have got agreement from the authors of these two other papers to do a, an individual patient meta-analysis to look at the sick patients to see whether if you're really unwell at baseline and you get one of these temperature controlling strategies, if we look at all the data in, in aggregate, uh, whether having temperature control is better. The other possibility is that paracetamol might actually matter. And in, in the HEAT study, we only gave paracetamol on average for two days. So patients got a median of eight doses. Um, they could have got far more paracetamol than they did. Um, and paracetamol does things other than reduce your body temperature. So uh, one of the things that's involved in oxidative stress is plasma cell-free haemoglobins, which cause oxidation of lipid membranes and release of isoprostanes, and they're involved in severe sepsis and indeed the pathogenesis of multi-organ failure from other causes as well. And paracetamol uh, blocks uh, that effect. 
Paracetamol is a tissue-specific inhibitor of COX-2, and it's also a cannabinoid agonist. And so one or a combination of these factors might actually give rise to an important biological role for paracetamol in, in treating patients with sepsis, um, and that's something that we're planning on exploring in a further study where we look at giving as much paracetamol as you possibly can to a, a cohort of patients. Um, that's uh, all I wanted to say about that, and thanks very much for listening. That's great. Thank you very much, Paul. We'll, uh, we've got plenty of time uh, for questions or comments. We'll throw it open to the, uh, the audience. Anything? No? Okay. Craig French. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Paul, one of the um, things that I always have is, is that uh, our bodies evolved over many, many millions of years to um, mount a response to infection. And one of them, teleologically, is that fever is, can be beneficial. And I think as you've you had your photos of animals up there and the response to animals to infection. Do you, I guess I could seek your opinion, the temperature reduction effect that you observed was relatively modest. How likely do you think it is that it is the antipyretic effect of paracetamol versus non-antipyretic effects that could explain this difference in um, time to death, basically, that you've observed? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I, I don't know the answer. Like, if I want to guess, and, and if you look at that distribution that I put up of, of ICU free days, one of the things that I think it looks like to me in the data set that we have here is that the, the effect for survivors was caused by um, the patients who had a very short ICU length of stay. Um, and I think that those patients were people who were not that sick. Um, and it's entirely possible, actually, that what we demonstrated there is like a behavioural intervention. So if you've got a bunch of patients who are kind of not that sick, but they're a bit febrile and they're a bit tachycardic and they're breathing a bit faster, then you'll be less inclined to discharge them from the intensive care unit. Um, and so it might actually just be that Reducing, and certainly the patients who were in the paracetamol arm were more likely to be afebrile on the day they were discharged from the ICU. So it might actually be that not giving the paracetamol just made you hold on to the patient for a little bit longer, and actually there was no biological effect on, on the natural history of the disease at all. Um, that doesn't really explain how the death was delayed, although maybe the same phenomenon applies, so perhaps it's that uh, you reduce the body temperature and you make the metabolic rate go, out, go down a bit and so the treating clinician's tricked into believing that someone who's a hopeless case actually isn't. Keeps on thrashing them for a few days longer. Oh, I don't know. Thank, thanks, Paul. A, a fantastic study. Um, you called it a Phase 2B. Um, what did you have in mind for Phase 3 since you cracked New England Journal with 2B? <laughs> well, look, I, I mean, I think... Um, whether, whether paracetamol matters or temperature matters or n neither matter is actually up for debate. You know, I, I, don't know the, I don't know the answer. So we are pursuing both things in parallel. So we've got a plan to do a feasibility study looking at whether giving as much paracetamol as possible uh, demonstrate signals of benefit and at the same time we're exploring whether more aggressive temperature control might be beneficial and I guess the two possible um, possible options for a phase three study might be a TTM trial for all comers sick ICU patients um, or they might be a, another paracetamol trial and I think there's a, probably another three or four or maybe five years worth of work before I can really tell you the answer to that. Um, just a quick question, Paul, in regards with your decision to discharge ICU free days, and did you consider uh, discharge or the day of discharge at the physical time the decision is being made or the physical time in which the patient is discharged? Because in our unit, in, we, we suffer from uh, high bed occupancy, and pretty much we're a bit blocked until someone needs a bed, and sometimes uh, that, I'm sure that that is happening everywhere. So it really is a grey area, this charge for us, time of the day. Um, I'm not sure exactly what endpoint did you consider in your study. 
Yes, so, so um, the answer is both. So, so we had two endpoints. One was ICU free days, which was just based on the time when the patient physically left. Um, and while accepting that that might depend on uh, factors other than the patient, presumably they would be randomly distributed between the two groups. We also uh, reported ICU support free days as well, which essentially was the time when the patient was physiologically well enough to leave the ICU, and, and there was basically no, they're the same. It didn't make any difference how you looked at it, it's the same. Thank you. I expect the pharmacologist would be interested if you had enough patients for a third arm and they received aspirin. For, uh, but I suppose it's confounding factors of more gastric irritation, more renal dysfunction, and hematologic effects would make it difficult to sort out its purely antipyretic effect. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the issue of whether asp aspirins are useful adjunct therapy for sepsis is something that is of considerable interest and in which uh, uh, there are members of the CTG exploring a large-scale trial to look at aspirin, both for, I mean, principally, I think, for its anti-inflammatory effects, but for its antipyretic effects as well, I guess. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you very much, Thank Paul. Thank you.